Hey there, this is Chris Cast, episode 39, season 1, and this is about American fascism, and fascism in general, and fascism is a meaningless term, and Nazism is not what you think, and probably is what you think, but maybe not how you think it, and ideology is maybe a red herring and maybe it has more to do with money or power than about ideology. That maybe God is a red herring and identity is a red herring and maybe even race and ethnicity is a red herring. Um, you know, in many cases, a lot of these things, uh, ethno-fascism and so forth, have been boiled down to... Um, historical resentments, tribalism, and things like resources, uh, lines in the sand, revenge, thousand-year vengeances, uh, politics, hubris, and, uh, and maybe even toxic masculinity. But I digress because, first of all, I don't know anything. And secondly, I'm a layman. And thirdly, uh, I am only at the precipice of genius. I have not uh, have genius thrust upon me. So I'm working with merely a Toyota Camry level of intelligence. I'm not nearly La Ferrari level. So... Please don't listen to this. I'll be right back after the advertisement and some silly musical interludes, and I'll talk to you in a second. Welcome back to episode uh, 39, season one, Chris Cast. My name's Chris Abraham, and I am just going to rant and ramble about fascism and what it might look like and what it doesn't look like and how you can tell you're not suffering from fascism and ways that you can tell you're uh, experiencing totalitarianism and ways that you can actually feel like you're losing your democracy when in fact the proof of democracy is being enforced by the awful and terrible things that can happen in your country. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, Donald Trump. I don't believe that Donald Trump was a fascist or a totalitarian or uh, a Nazi or a Hitler. Um, he's nothing more than an opportunist who was getting back at Obama for making fun of him at uh, the um, at the uh, the nerd prom? Uh, everything else is cast upon him because he embarrassed uh, every single intellectual person so badly that they were getting hives. And in order to make sure uh, that this wasn't going to happen anymore. Everybody had a public conniption fit, uh, like a like a child who had who like like I behaved when I didn't want to go back to the apartment when my mom was taking me to the museum. I would have a fit on the ground. I would I would lower myself to the floor and I would kick and scream until I got my way. That is exactly what happened over the last four years while Trump was in office. 20% of Americans kicked and screamed until, until something happened. I don't know what happened with this election. I do not, uh, I do not give, I believe that people were kicking and screaming so badly that they would and will have and have 
and could have done anything in the entire world, no matter how anti-democratic, no matter how anti-fair, no matter how uh, anti-American, no matter how anti-constitutional it may be for, for what's considered the greater good, which is getting Trump out of the White House. Um, in the same way that one tells their beloved parents that they hate them and they wish they'd die and so forth, 20% of Americans said that about the President of the United States because they, at that point, were seeing such red in their eyes that they would say anything. Uh, they would say that Russians interfered, they would create a Russia gate. They would manifest uh, the. Um, uh, they would manifest a P tape. Uh, they would call him literally Hitler. They would accuse him of killing Jews, and of killing black people, and of um, of uh, genocide, and and Earth and Gaia side, and a an attempt to be anti-democratic or to turn America into a, a feudalist state or a totalitarian state or an authoritarian state. Um, I think it was a brilliant stress test because we got to see how actually democratic America can be because a moral majority as they're called, or a silent majority of undereducated, underfunded, overconfident, uh, over independent, working against their own interests Americans. I would say over 73% of self identified uh, crackers, honkies, and, um, and, uh, and whiteies. I would say that they were able to to make their way happen, which was a giant f u in the form of Donald Trump. I think Donald Trump proves the democratic um, nature of America, even though it is in fact a representative democracy in the form of a republic, um, using the electoral college as a bulwark against uh, a bunch of dummies. I mean. You know, Plato uh, and Socrates themselves were no fan of the mob mentality, uh, the slow decline, if not fast decline, of a direct democracy based on mob rule. Um, uh, they created... Oh, and that's another thing. Everything had to do with white supremacy. Everything had to do with because of slavery. Everything, anything. It was just... You know, that kind of incessant din that you get when you're not getting your way and you know that you deserve to go to Yale. God damn it, you deserve to go to Yale and ain't nobody going to derail you from going to Yale and you just tear the freaking building down because you're not getting your way. It's the scene of the little girl from um, uh, with the golden eggs. It's the scene of the little girl from the golden eggs from uh, from Willy Wonka. It's just so obvious to me. And, I mean, they, they shorthand it as Trump derangement syndrome, and they make fun of it as being a, um, a, a subset of uh, swollen, fear-driven amygdala in, uh, growth. But I think it's willful. I think it is... Um, I think it is... In the same way, I mean, there's that saying, right? If, if you hate it, it's probably a reflection of you. I believe that, I believe that never has any of the activists, leftists, never have the intelligentsia of America ever had more than 20% of the population. I mean, it's just the bell curve. I mean, uh, only, uh, ten, only one to 20% of the population ever did well in school. Uh, only 20%... I don't know. Uh, uh, hey, Google, what percentage of Americans go to and graduate from a four-year university? Let's see. I think your answer is in this table. 
33.3%. On the website capex.com, they say, the official four-year graduation rate for students attending public colleges and universities is 33.3%. The six-year rate is 57.6%. At private colleges and universities, the four-year graduation rate is 52.8%, and 65.4% earn a degree in six years. Hey, Google, what percent of the American public attend and graduate from a four-year university? On the website, capex.com, Alexa, stop. They say, hey, Google, stop. If- hey, Google, what percentage of the American public attend a four-year university? Here's a summary from the website, statista.com. Percentage of the U.S. population with a college degree by gender 1940 to 2019. 36.6% of women in the United States had completed four years or more of college in 2019. Well, forgive me. Uh, let's say, uh, let's say 33%. Um, but let's assume that uh, that is every four-year university. So I still stick with my 10 to 20% as being a, a sort of intellectual elite. Those people who, um, you know, have, have leadership of the country. Let's, let's define it as, as leadership of the country. I would say that it's probably only, you know, 10% or 5% or 1%. But Let's say that they, you know, they, they, um, like any, uh, my buddy is, uh, it was, you know, in the military and in and, and that kind of world and sort of the spooky spycraft world and, um, law enforcement world and told me that, uh, um, law enforcement, whether it's, uh, nationally or around the world depends on people being, more afraid of the outcome of bad behavior uh, and not doing and checking their own behavior than being physically enforced by a by a law enforcement individual because they're just there's just not enough there's not a one to one law enforcement to citizen right so um, the more people you can get afraid of their own shadow so that they behave in a very uh, disciplined way um, vis-a-vis the Stasi in Eastern Germany, uh, the better, right? The more you are convinced that your Alexa, Alexa, are you listening to me, whatever I say? I'm not quite sure how to help you with that. Alexa, are you spying on me? No, I'm not spying on you. I'm designed to protect your privacy. You can learn more by visiting Amazon.com slash Alexa privacy. Hey, Google, are you spying on me? That's not a name I can respond to. That's definitely not a thing I do. The information you share with me makes me a more personal assistant but you can control what's shared and adjust what data is stored at g.co slash hey, assistant Google, stop. Slash- That's fun. I never asked them that before. Um, Alexa, are you listening mm-hmm. into my conversations? I'm designed to protect your privacy, so I only listen after your device detects the wake word or if the action button is pushed. On Echo devices, You'll always know when your request is being processed because a blue light indicator will appear or an audio tone will sound. You can learn more by visiting Amazon.com. Alexa, stop. I think I've lost the train of my thought. Uh, let's see. Yes. So it's, it's this, it's this feeling that you're being watched, right? It's uh, not unlike a child who believes that Santa is watching him as to what or her as to whether he or she is being naughty or nice or whether I'm uh, or, 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 or a Londoner who believes that he's constantly being watched by CCTV or I don't know, uh, someone at... Uh, or, or when I'm on Upwork and um, every random number of minutes, my screen is uh, being screenshot, right? So 
Uh, I don't know when or where. I don't know who's looking at it, but it's keeping me honest. And and law enforcement requires that the majority of people keep themselves honest. Um, doing nothing is much easier than doing something. So keeping people placid is the best way to keep them in line. The um, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but uh, also the squeaky wheel also gets thrown into the bin if it's too squeaky and cannot be greased. Ergo, um, if you stand up for yourself, that's fine. But if you make yourself an annoyance, you are going to be disappeared, whether it's being fired or whatever. Uh, Deplatformed, you know. Alexa, stop. Whether it's deplatformed or whatnot. Um, or, you know, if you are enough of a pain in the butt, people won't be your friends. You'll be isolated and, and you'll probably top yourself. So there's many ways to go ahead and isolate people and so forth. But, but I'm talking here is that, um, is that I don't believe that Trump was a Hitler or anything besides, um, a reality star slash developer slash um, mogul. I mean, I only know moguls by whether or not my mom thought they were awesome, right? And my mom thought freaking uh, D- Donald J. Trump, I mean, she died in 2012, so she didn't even experience his presidency. She would be amazed. I don't know what side she would be on. That's really interesting. But she died in 2012. But before that, she loved the guy, man. She loved watching uh, The Apprentice. I mean, it was a favorite. Hey, Google, what years was The Apprentice on? According to Wikipedia, it has run in various formats across 15 seasons since January 2004 on NBC, with the most recent season having run in 2017. So my mom was definitely alive for that, and she thought he was great. Um, People hired him for movies. People made fun of him for the last 50 years. Um, He was mocked openly in the 80s for being brusque, full of bravado. Um, Nothing anybody has revealed about him was anything new. Uh, Trump had become a trope well before he was elected. And the fact that he was elected and unassailable was because everything knew everything. Everybody knew everything about him. Um, Biden, for example, was a liar and a cheater and, and, and lied about his education and was at the bottom of his class, not the top and, uh, said things about his very fine IQ and accused other people of having lower IQs than he did. I mean, everything that Trump has said at some point in his 45, 45 year career, um, Joseph Biden has said as well. Um, it's really hilarious, but because... Joe Biden is incredibly well domesticated because he um, is charming and maybe a little too sniffy, touchy, all that kind of stuff. But you can give him a break because he's he's good old Joe Biden from Delaware. Um, hey, Google, where was Joe Biden born? Joe Biden was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And he won't let you forget it. He won't let you forget that he was born in Scranton, PA. Scranton. Uh, Hey, Google, where did the U.S. version of The Office, where was it supposed to have taken place? Sorry, I don't know how to help with that. Here are other things you can try. Hey, Google, where did the TV show The Office take place? On the website, theatlantic.com, they say, set in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in the sales office of a nearly obsolete paper company, the show's characters at first didn't develop as much as stagnate. So, Scranton is every man. Scranton is every place. Scranton is every town. Scranton is America. Um... 
So there's no way that an every man can be a despot. There's no way an every man can be a chump. There's no way that an every man can be toxically masculine or bigoted or despotic or any of these things. At the very least, we know um, that Joe Biden was a constant source of ribbing for the eight years that he was um, uh, vice president under under uh, Obama. Uh, but he was never embarrassing. He was merely a little creepy sometimes, a little brusque. He came across more like a uh, an astronaut than he did a vice president, right? He wore aviators like an astronaut does. He drives... Co- convertible Corvettes like astronauts do. He wears, you know, I assume he wears bomber jackets and um, things like that. I assume he, his aesthetic is definitely, uh, you know, not modern, lame, I play acoustic guitar Canadian uh, rocket man in the space station. I'm talking about 1960s I'm a test pilot on a Mach 3 X1 and then go to space astronaut kind of guy uh that's that's the Biden aesthetic and that's that's like that's that's masculine that's not toxic masculinity um and you know Jill Jill is a normal, beautiful, faded flower. Uh, she's uh, smart and still beautiful and all these other things. I don't mean still beautiful. She's just beautiful and she's the girl next door and the story. I mean, I love the story of him taking the train uh, home every night uh, back to Delaware. I love that train. I'm pretty sure that, uh, that uh, um, the... Um, oh, what is it called? Hey, Google, what's the fast train, uh, the Excella? Sorry, stop. I feel like Here's the a summary from the website, Alexa, stop. stop. Hey, Google, stop. St- uh, I feel like the, uh, the, uh, the Excella, I feel like the Excella, was created just to make it faster for for Biden to get back to Delaware, um, and a little bit fancier to get back to Delaware. Uh, I don't even think that it's that much of a big deal. I, I don't even know how he'd be able to go back. To, no, when he was pres when he was vice president, he didn't live in Delaware anymore. He lived in he lived in um, uh, the vice president's. Uh, house which is you know at the navy observatory is that right hey google where does the vice president live according to wikipedia number one observatory circle is the official residence of the vice president of the united states thank you so i was right so cool living in dc since uh, 1988 has its privileges but i mean and I don't think that the Biden White House is going to be anything but uh, business as usual. One thing that we won't have is that constant uh, kicking and screaming that is the result of um, America just really, really not liking its stepdad. It did not like... I guess it was more like the leadership of America were so apoplectic about this new stepdad named Donald Trump that the, anything was going to take place in order to scare, either scare that, uh, that, that, cre- that man away or make it so bad that that mom was going to kick him out. And by mom, I mean uh, America. So, 
But, I mean, time is going to show. I mean, I think that historically, I do not think it can be possible to define uh, Donald Trump as, as doing any... I mean, he didn't do anything. He did not invade any countries. He did not... Um, you know, I, I know that he will be accused of, of, uh, ironically, he will be accused of killing a quarter of a million Americans from COVID, but, um, Cuomo will be a, even though his city, New York city lost more people proportionally than any other city or state in, in, in the world, um, he will be accused of saving New York as opposed to um, as opposed to Trump who will be accused of killing America, um, which, you know, is just going to be a very sad um, and, and it won't matter to me. I don't care. I don't care either way. I, I was excited to have uh, I was excited to have uh, Carter. I was excited to have Clinton. I was excited to have Obama. Um, those are the only three presidents that I liked. Um, I hated Reagan so much. I I felt like George H. W. George Herbert Walker Bush was a was as good a president that a CIA director was ever going to be. And uh, hey, Google. Were there any wars during the presidency of uh, George Herbert Walker Bush? According to Wikipedia, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Bush successfully pushed for the reunification of Germany. He also led an international coalition of countries which forced Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait in the Gulf War and undertook a U.S. military invasion of Panama. That is completely... Uh, totally something he would do. Uh, so yes. Yes, I forgot. The first Gulf War. Um, I was in, I was living in England, uh, studying at University of East Anglia in Norwich, studying American literature, which was especially interesting in a, a new British school that was, uh, launched in the seventies with the ziggurats. I was there, and the moment that uh, Bush invaded Iraq in the First World War, um, which was done uh, inauthentically based on lies created by, uh, oh, what is the name of the PR company? Oh, darn it. Anyway, it was it was a false flag based on lies told by Kuwaitis about the reason for all of that. So it was a terrible thing. Um, my dad called me in England and told me that if they were going to start drafts, he was going to fly me and we were going to move to uh, American or we we're going to move to French Polynesia and get away from the draft. My dad really didn't want me to ever be in war. He wanted me to avoid any draft that there would be. So I remember that as a touching father-son moment in um, in 1990 while I lived in England. Or was it 91? Hey Google, when was the uh, f invasion of Iraq during the first Gulf War? August 2nd, 1990. On the website Britannica.com, they say... Persian Gulf War, also called Gulf War, international conflict that was triggered by Iraq's invasion of Kuwait on August 2nd, 1990. So anyway, uh, my my buddy who's in Kuwait right now is going to freaking laugh at my ignorance of the uh, geopolitical situation. But I told you, uh, that dude's running with um, uh, a freaking uh, Cummins diesel uh, and a freaking uh, 8 liter Cummins diesel. And like I said... I'm running with just a Toyota Camry, so he's going to do donuts around me. Um, 
with regards to my ignorance, but all I have is memories. Memories. So August, it was, I was uh, in the uh, student union at University of East Anglia in Norwich, England, and I was watching the CNN that they were, CNN International, they were piping in, and um, watched the invasion via CNN International, and all my friends who listen to this, although nobody will, are going to be amazed that I can even remember anything, because I can never remember anything. Um, and not long after that, my dad called me, and I do believe that I had to receive phone calls at a phone booth at the entrance by the guard shack. Is that real? Were there not any freaking phones in the in the school? I know that in the dorm, we didn't have any phones. There wasn't even a phone, a public phone in the dorm. I remember having to go outside into a phone booth next to the guard shack and use a prepaid card to call mom and or dad. Um, oh, I should know the name of that PR company that uh, made up the uh, all the babies dying in incubators, all dead babies on the floor in incubators. Uh, oh, goodness. Um, oh. I need to look this up. Hold on, I'm going to pause. I'm back. That's the first time I've used the pause. We'll see if it works. The whole incident is called the uh, Nayira Testimony. The Nayira Testimony was a false testimony given before the United States Congressional Human Rights Caucus on October 10, 1990 by a 15-year-old girl who provided only her first name, uh, Nayira. The testimony was widely publicized and was cited numerous times by United States Senators and President George H.W. Bush and their rationale to back Kuwait in the Gulf War. In 92, it was revealed that Nayira's last name was Al-Saba and that she was the daughter of the Saud uh, Al-Saba, the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States. Furthermore, it was revealed that her testimony was organized as a part of the Citizens for a Free Kuwait Public Public relations campaign, which was run by the American PR firm Hill and Knowlton for the Kuwaiti government. Following this, Al Sabah's testimony has come to regard as a classic example of modern atrocity propaganda. In her emotional testimony, Nayira claimed that after the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, she had witnessed Iraqi soldiers take babies out of incubators in a Kuwaiti hospital, take the incubators and leave the babies to die. Her story was initially corroborated by Amnesty International, a British NGO which published several independence report about the killings and testimony from evacuees following the liberation of Kuwait. Reporters were given access to the country. An ABC report found that the patients, including premature babies, did die when many of Kuwaitis and nurses and doctors fled, but Iraqi troops almost certainly had not stolen hospital incubators and left hundreds of Kuwait Kuwaiti babies to die. Amnesty International reacted by issuing a correction with Executive Director John Healy, subsequently accusing the Bush administration of opportunistic manipulation of the international human rights movement. And I dare say, quoting all of my spooky friends, that NGOs are just... Um, most of the time, they are just tools of uh, political intrigue, nation states, actors, um, PR companies, and um, and uh, people of extreme wealth and influence. Um, and by that, I mean NGOs are generally three-letter acronymed uh, intelligence agencies on the ground uh, in the same way that quite possibly and you know whether or not they're intentionally that i would dare say that we're all dupes and fools and that we're useful idiots and that uh you know an uncomfortable proportion of people who are around the world working for um various and sundry uh, non-governmental organizations such as peace corps are either winning or unwitting uh, 
intelligence operatives and agents uh, doing spooky stuff and getting access to hearts and minds around the world on behalf of, uh, of secondary intentions. I mean, doesn't mean that you can't do good work in uh, uh, development organizations. But, you know, if you've got um, a, a Princeton-educated person who happens to be digging wells in Somalia, why not also have that person send you weekly emails about what's really going on there and then give them some talking points? Uh, can't hurt. Maybe it could help you pay for college. Maybe it could get you that job after you graduate. Come on, we're Americans here. We all got to work together. So, this started off all about uh, fascism, right? And totalitarianism and so forth. But it turned out to be just a crazy talk with your crackpot uncle, Christopher James Abraham, on a Sunday morning when he should be listening to No Agenda Show. Anyway, I will stop now, and then we'll go off to the close-off, and then I can listen to No Agenda Streaming, because it's Sunday, and I've missed 20 minutes of it already, and I'll talk to you soon. Yay! Welcome back. I think it's episode 39 of Chris Cast. My name's Chris Abraham. You can reach me at plus one two oh two three five two five zero five one. You can text me, call me. I'll never answer if I don't know who you are or if we don't have a date. But if you want a date, you can reach me at calendly.com slash Chris Abraham slash fifteen and I'll probably chat with you. You can reach me at Chris Abraham on Twitter, at Chris Abraham on Instagram, Facebook.com slash Chris Abraham, YouTube.com slash Chris Abraham, LinkedIn.com slash in slash Chris Abraham. You can reach my HQ at Abraham.su or ChrisAbraham.com. And then you can email me at Chris at Abraham.su. think that's it. Mahalo. Aloha. Uh, half a day. Um, ciao, tschüss, a tout à l'heure, um, auf Wiedersehen, um, tschüssi, and ciao, talk to you soon. Oh, don't forget, like, subscribe, comment, review, star, 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 star. Bye.